Hello, students of statics. Welcome to this introduction to chapter two, which is covering uh, forces and other vectors. Now, I'm going to blaze through a whole bunch of vector topics in this first introductory um, video, knowing that if you need to brush up on some of these, there's plenty of content in your textbook to do so. Okay, so I'm making a general assumption that you're fairly comfortable with one-dimensional and two-dimensional vector addition, subtraction. Um, that's addition both using vector triangles, which is more a graphical approach, as well as vector components or kind of vector algebra approach that you can compute 2D unit vectors. Now, you may not have realized that you were doing this with sine and cosine, but I'll show you that quickly. And also that you can find right-hand rule coordinate systems. It's fundamentally, that you understand how to use the right-hand rule to cross X into y is z so if you need to catch up on any of these topics after watching this video please see our engineering statics textbook all right so that being said let's go ahead and um, talk about these things briefly first of all we're going to talk about the difference between a vector and a scalar now vectors are made up of three things vectors include a magnitude a direction and fundamentally some people include it as part of the magnitude but i like putting it here separate they also have units okay so the magnitude is the number the direction is fundamentally what direction those those units are the number is going in and then the units are whatever unit system that you're using scalars have two of these three they have magnitudes and also units but notice that they have no direction, okay? And so we can express terms in terms of a vector or in terms of a scalar. And really the difference is the directionality of that. Now, as far as our notation goes, in my handwritten notes and in the book, we end up using subtly different notation for both vectors and scalars. So in my handwritten notes, and when I write a vector, I'm going to write that as a vector with an arrow over the top, okay? So that arrow is gonna be the key thing. In your book, a vector will look like a bold bold face font okay so bolded and we have an arrow and a scalar in handwritten notes will just look like just a, a letter okay and in your book a scalar will typically be written in italics Okay, so subtle variations, but the key things to look for here are the arrow above it in your notes and a bold typeface in the book, mean a vector. And you're gonna need to get pretty good this semester at indicating which terms are vectors and which terms are scalars. You will lose points if you don't differentiate because there's a lot of relationships that are true for vectors, which are maybe not true for scalars. And so as we look at vectors and we think about the direction of a vector, we can identify what's called the line of action. Okay, and so the line of action fundamentally identifies the direction the vector is going in. Let's call this a force vector, we'll call it F. Labeling it with my vector arrow. And so it turns out with this line of action that we can So it turns out with this line of action that we can actually grab a hold of this vector and we can slide it anywhere we want along that line of action and it actually represents the exact same vector. Okay, it's the same length that it was and it's going in the same direction. And so it turns out it's the same vector along its line of action. And that becomes a pretty handy tool when we're trying to solve problems that we can move vectors along their lines of action to simplify some of our computations. Uh, additionally, a few definition points here. Every vector has both what we call a tip and a tail. So we label this as the tip or the arrowhead. 
and the tail is the like where the fletchings would be on an arrow. So the tip, the tail, the line of action. Uh, the sense is fundamentally the sense of this vector is whether the vector arrow is going basically up to the right along the line of action or down to the left. Okay, if we wanted to flip this vector around, we'd actually take the negative of this vector and it physically flips it around in the other direction. Another thing to identify here is we can vector identify a vector between points. Okay, so if I call this point A and I call the tip over here point B, I can label that my F, this would be F of A, B. Okay, it's always going to be defined as um, your vector. We always label this from and then to. Okay, the where it's coming from, going to. Now there is another format that we'll use in dynamics, which is actually using F. It's a relative format, and that we'd write B relative to A. Okay, so we won't get that too much, but realize that these two are actually exactly the same thing. Either from to with no slash between them, or of B relative to A is more kind of a, a vector displacement mentality. Um, for those. All right, and so as we look at vector addition, we think about vector addition. If I have a couple vectors, let's say that I have one vector here, let's call it vector C, and another vector here, vector D, there's two different ways that I can add these vectors. One of them is tip to tail, and the other one is using a parallelogram. Okay, so let's look at each one of these. So if I'm using a uh, tip to tail, I actually take this vector here and I move it so that its tail is touching the tip of the other. And here we'd be adding C vector plus D vector. And we can label a third vector here that we call the resultant. Resultant always means sum of, and I call this vector R. So I can say C plus D is equal to R, my resultant. Now it turns out that I could also flip the order of these and I could say that D plus C is also equal to R and I can show that I'll do that here with dotted lines. Okay, so call this D. And actually, let me call this D prime because it's not along the same line of action of D, and so that would be breaking that rule, saying it's actually the same vector. And let me call this C vector prime. And so C prime and C are parallel. D prime and D are parallel. They both have the same length. And so let me label it here. D prime plus C prime also equal R. Okay, so what that's saying is that since the order doesn't matter, we can say that vector addition is commutative. The order in which you add them does not matter. Now, the other way that we can add these, once again, this is the tip to tail. We can also add them using a parallelogram. Now using a parallelogram, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put their tails together. So here would be C, here would be D, horizontal, putting the tails together. And then it turns out we end up with a parallelogram like this, and this would be, and this would be our resultant force R. Okay, and so this is our parallelogram. technique, and we could write the same equations associated with that. All right, so let's take a quick look at vector subtraction. One important part about subtraction is to think about the negative of a vector. And so it turns out that if I have a vector here, let's say this is vector D, that the negative of vector D is going to be parallel, exactly the same length, so this would be negative D. And all we did was flip around its direction. Okay, so that's an important kind of key step in thinking about vector subtraction. And so if that's vector D and here we have vector E, 
we could write that um, e vector minus d vector the way that that would look in a graphical form let's go ahead and draw e okay and so now we're going to use instead of positive d we're going to use this negative d and so that will be coming back down in this direction and so we end up let's say e minus d is equal to f so my f vector would be right here. Okay, so that's using the tip to tail once again. Just the only difference there is we need to make sure we use the negative of d because we're subtracting vector d from vector e. Now, of course, you could do this with components as well, just kind of highlighting here the graphical terms. The next um, expression to look at is essentially how we can list out these vectors as components. Okay, so two dimensional dimensional vector components. So if I have a vector, let's go ahead and use V. Let's um, add an axis system. Anytime we're talking about components, we need an axis system. So we'll go with a horizontal X, a vertical Y. Our axis systems don't have to be horizontal or vertical, but we'll just assume we'll start with those. And that we could draw the components of this vector as V sub X. That's still a vector. And excuse me, I got the wrong subscript there. I'll make mistakes so you don't have to. V sub Y and v sub x, also a vector. Okay, in order to find v sub x and v sub y, one of the things that we can do is actually use an angle here. Let's call this angle theta. Now, not all angles have to be called theta. Not all angles have to be coming from a horizontal. That just happens to be the one that we're using for this situation. All right, so as we um, take a look at this system, there's some things I wanted to find. One of those is I have a X, Y Cartesian coordinate system. All right, and Cartesian coordinate systems were created by Rene Descartes, uh, also in the 17th century when Sir Isaac Newton was working on his um, three laws. And Cartesian coordinate system essentially never changes in direction. So it's like a universal coordinate system that is tied to, call it tied to the level of Earth, level Earth, because we all know that the Earth is level and not round. Um, and that vertical is going to be perpendicular to that, right? So it's this coordinate system which does not move. But the handy thing about it is that the X and the Y are perpendicular. Now, one way you know that you've drawn a right hand coordinate system. is that x crossed into y and this would be the positive x crossed into the positive y axis points in the positive z direction Okay, and so using a cross product, now you can use two, two different flavors of cross products. I'll post an additional video about cross products. There's a three finger cross product and also kind of slide and curl cross product. Also take a look at your book for this. So we'd find out that if we are crossing our X axis into our Y axis, it turns out we're gonna end up with a Z axis, which is coming out of the page. Okay, so this is Z out of the screen. Okay, so X cross into Y is a positive Z. So some other things I can identify with this system is that I can write my vector. I can say that V vector is equal to, um, I could write this in a bracket notation of VX comma, vy 
where Vx and Vy are the magnitude of the two components. Now this is always written in the order for xy in x comma y. I could also add in something that are called unit vectors. Now unit vectors I can also write these components with respect to unit vectors. Now, unit vectors lie upon lines. We have some special unit vectors. The special unit vector in the x direction is i hat, in the y direction is j hat, and so we have this i hat comma j hat, and these are defined as unit vectors. along x and y. The whole thing about a unit vector is they have a length of one unit, and it actually is a unitless unit. Okay, So all unit vectors fundamentally are pure direction. And hopefully you can see that as I'm going to scroll back up here and look at the definition of a vector, right? A vector is made up of a magnitude, a direction, and units. And if I take that a unit vector has a magnitude of 1 and it doesn't have any units, you're left only with direction. Okay, so unit vectors are pure direction. They're fundamentally a different way of just expressing the direction of a line or of a vector. Okay, so that's i hat and j hat. And so using i hat and j hat, I can write that v as a vector is equal to the magnitude vx, so that's the value and the units, times the direction i hat plus vy in the direction of j hat. Okay, so a totally equivalent form of that vector. Another equivalent form would be this. That would be that my vector v is equal to the total magnitude v. Now I'm going to pick up some right triangle trig here based upon this right triangle right here and this theta angle. So this is going to be v times the cosine of theta. Right? From Sokotoa, we know that the cosine of theta is the adjacent side, so the bottom edge here. And this would be times i hat. And then we can add to that um, the and, you know, bracket right here. So v times this whole thing. And then it's going to be the sine of theta times j hat. So, I talked about unit vectors in two dimensions. You probably didn't realize it, but by taking the sine and the cosine of an angle, what you're actually creating is a unit vector along the hypotenuse. So, we could call this v hat, the unit vector along the hypotenuse of that triangle. Okay, so this is equal to v hat. So fundamentally, cosine and sine of an angle are finding the unit vector along the hypotenuse. Uh, the last relationship that I'll add to here is based more upon the magnitudes than the vectors themselves. It is Pythagorean theorem, but we could write that v as a magnitude is equal to the square root of my vx component squared plus my v y component squared. Keep in mind that the Pythagorean theorem only works for right triangles. Inevitably, every single semester that I teach statics, I see someone applying the Pythagorean theorem to essentially non-right triangle legs. It only works for right triangles, essentially where your hypotenuse is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of your other two legs, and it's basically the two legs that are separated by that right angle. So I hope that this has helped you kind of both review and also maybe learn a few new things about vector notation, vector terminology for both one-dimensional and two-dimensional vectors.